the tenth day of the first month of the Islamic calendar in the year 61 on the hot desert plains of Karbala, a small city just south of the current Iraqi capital of Baghdad. A small group of 73 noble individuals were massacred by an army of 70,000. The victims were respected followers of the religion of Islam. The perpetrators, led by Yazid, son of Muawiyah, claimed to follow that very same religion. The leader of the small group of men, women and children was the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, Hussein, son of Ali. Only 50 years had passed since the death of the last messenger of God, and yet already the Islamic nation, the Ummah, was in turmoil. The events that led to the tragedies in Karbala, however, did not begin with the reign of Yazid as the Caliph, the leader of the Ummah. They began to unfold in the last moments of Muhammad's life. In the 11th year of the Islamic calendar in the holy city of Medina, the Prophet Muhammad was nearing the end of his life. The members of his household and close companions who had stood by him in times of both ease and difficulty remained near his bedside until he left this world. On news of his death, while some mourned and grieved the loss of their beloved, others were preoccupied in a conspiracy to obtain power for themselves. You would imagine that this person, being on his deathbed, having warned the people on so many different occasions of his, of his impending uh, passing away, uh, you would imagine that there would be a very large crowd of people surrounding him, attending to his every wish and his every request, basically praying uh, for his quick recovery. And yet... When you look at historical accounts, you see a very different picture. Whilst those who had heeded the Prophet's calls and already given their allegiances to Ali were busy burying Muhammad, a secret meeting was being held between several tribal leaders in a small hut or saqifa in an attempt to secure the future leadership of the Ummah. These leaders all sought to grasp the rulership of the Islamic nation in turn ensuring that only they were the sole beneficiaries of power. Initially what happened was there was a, a conspiracy to conceal the Prophet's death. Um, there were calls made that anyone claiming that the Prophet has died will be beheaded. In other words, the idea was to contain the situation, control the, uh, the, the emotional outpour that would inevitab inevitably ensue after the Prophet's uh, martyrdom uh, or, or passing away. And the idea was to contain all of that until some sort of, uh, of an interim co government was, was in place. It wasn't a democratic process. It wasn't a lobbying process taking place. It was essentially a bunch of people fighting one another over uh, the opportunity to fill that void. Those who remained loyal and thought that we have already, we have already paid allegiance to Ali. How could we discuss our thing and try to rethink about it? And they refused to pay allegiance to, or to even take part in this sort of discussion. Upon hearing of the meeting that took place at Saqifa, Ali and his loyal supporters gathered at his house to discuss the situation at hand. The tribal leaders who had by now chosen Abu Bakr as the new Caliph of Islam took it upon themselves to obtain Ali's allegiance, if necessary, by force. Uh, 
um, there was an ambush that took place against the house of Imam Ali. And the really tragic aspect of this is that Imam Ali was not just any other companion to the Prophet. Uh, he was not just the closest friend to the Prophet. He was not just the one who was raised by the Prophet himself. Uh, he grew up in the house of the Prophet of Islam. Um, the, the Prophet was his caretaker. But not only was he that close to the Prophet, he was also the husband of the Prophet's only daughter, the chief and the mistress of the women of the world, uh, Lady Fatima. May Allah's uh, peace and blessings be upon her. It is narrated by the wife of the Prophet, Um Salama, that Fatima most resembled her father in her character, conduct, and compassion. The most important part which, which really touches us, and especially me, is that the amazing relationship she had with her servant, Bibi Fizza. That Bibi Fatima had told Bibi Fizza that, look, you are in my house, you are brought in this house as a servant, but one day you will work and I will rest, and one day I will work and you rest. And this is an amazing um, message to and to, to humanity and to, to all of us that <clears throat> Islam is the only religion which tells us that even our servants or even people who are working under us have got their rights, have got respect, and how we should maintain it. Fatima Zahra to me, when I think about her, I think of her as a mother and it just goes to show how important women are in Islam and according to God because 11 of the Imams go back to her. I think in, in all her life, um, her lifestyle was extremely modest. Um, she wasn't into any sort of worldly gain. If you just think upon her mahar, which was chosen by her father, um, she completely agreed to that. She didn't look at the status of Imam Ali when, when she decided that she will marry him. She saw his noble character and she saw in him that he is good for her, not only for in this world, but her, the hereafter. The Prophet, he says, Fatima is my, is a part of me. She's a part of my flesh. She's a part of my soul and spirit. Fatima tu bada'atun minni. Man ardaha faqad ardani. Anyone who pleases her has pleased me. And he doesn't say anyone who pleases her is like one who pleases me. No, he's saying that Fatima is somehow directly connected to my soul. Anyone pleasing her, her will have pleased me. Anyone who angers her, angers me. Anyone who hurts her, has hurt me. And anyone who hurts me, hurts Allah. And anyone hurts Allah, receives the damnation and the curse of Allah. So those who crushed Fatima between the wall and the door, it wasn't just Fatima that they crushed, they crushed the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa himself between the wall and the door. They angered Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala from the very top of his throne. The ambush that took place that night at the house of Ali caused critical injuries to the daughter of the Holy Prophet. Not only did they result in the miscarriage of her unborn child, eventually, her injuries led to her death a mere six months after the passing of her father. The martyrdom of Fatima had deepened the division that had taken place between the household of Muhammad and those who opposed them. The household of the Prophet of Islam, uh, they are called the Ahlul Bayt, the people of the house. And the people of the house refers to 14 specific individuals, starting with the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as well as his, uh, his successor, the commander of the faithful, Imam Ali, his daughter Fatima al-Zahra, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, who were uh, his grandchildren, as well as the nine specific uh, descendants of Imam Hussein. Uh, may God's peace and blessings be upon them all. The Ahl al-Bayt are the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him who are recognized as being the keepers of the knowledge of the Prophet and the protectors of God's law on earth. They are mentioned on numerous occasions in the Quran, most notably in Surah 33, Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 33. Verily, God only wishes to remove all impurities from you, O people of the house, 
and to purify you with a thorough purification. The events that took place at Karbala in the year 61 of the Islamic calendar were centered around Hussein, the son of Fatima and Ali, and the grandson of the Holy Prophet. No one shares with Imam Hussein this merit other than his mother Fatima sallallahu when the Prophet said that Hussein is from me and I'm from Hussein. This link is not emotional. It is not something to say that, okay, the Prophet sallallahu wants to show his love to his grandson Hussein at all. No, it is something in the depth of our understanding. When the news of the birth of Imam Hussein was related to the Holy Prophet by Asma, and the Holy Prophet had the news, he went to welcome his grandson, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. When he was given this young baby, actually the Holy Prophet was very happy. But after a few minutes, he started crying, shedding tears. And Asma couldn't understand that. He, she wanted to know, what is this? And she did ask actually the Holy Prophet, why are you crying? Then the Holy Prophet وسلم, said, I'm crying because of my son, this. Asma said, but she, he, he is Walidu Sa'a. He has just been born. Why are you crying for? Then the Holy Prophet had to, to tell Asma what will happen in Karbala. It will be a very sad event. He would kiss Imam Hussein's hands. He would kiss his lips. He would kiss his under his throat, he would uh, hold him, he would let him uh, go on his shoulder. So it was public, he was showing people how much love he has for Imam Hussein. The Holy Prophet وسلم, used to call Al Imam Al Hassan and Al Hussein as uh, my sons. And by, by the way, if you look uh, in reality, they were not sons, they were uh, grandsons. But he used to call them Abna'i to show that special love. We find with Imam al-Hussein that he comes forward and is recognized by many as a person of the highest morals and a person of great character and a person, most importantly, of humility. Without the rise of Imam Hussein salam, no one would know anything about Islam at all. In the final days of Abu Bakr's caliphate, he appointed Umar al-Khattab to follow him, who in turn was succeeded by Uthman ibn Affan. Upon Uthman's murder, however, the Ummah urged Ali to become the caliph. After much deliberation, Ali accepted the call and made Kufa, at the time a garrison city, the new Islamic capital. However, he was still opposed on many fronts. After four years of difficult rule, he was murdered whilst leading the morning prayers in the city of Kufa. The situation became so dire for the Ummah and the Ahlul Bayt that Hassan, the eldest son of Ali, who had been appointed to rule after him, was left with minimal support. The Islamic capital was moved to Damascus and Muawiyah, son of Abu Sufyan, began the dynasty of Bani Umayyah. Umayyah only accepted um, Islam when he knew that it was um, politically and financially beneficial for him to do so. Muawiyah ruled Syria with dictatorship. With, and, and, and he, he, he was driving and being to fabricate hadiths in favor of Muawiyah and against Imam Ali Therefore, within Bani Umayyah, God describes them in chapter 17 of the Quran, verse number 60, as being the cursed tree, the tree that sought to fight the religion of Islam and the teachings of the Prophet. Muawiyah was known as an extremely oppressive leader, and his oppression was most meted out against the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Amongst these companions, for example, one finds the great companion Ammar ibn Yasir, 
whose two par whose parents, Sumayyah and Yasser, were the first martyrs in Islam. When we look at Ammar bin Yasser, the Prophet used to say, Ammar taqtiluka al-fi'atul baghiyah. Ammar, you will be killed by infidels. And who was it that killed Ammar bin Yasser? Ammar was killed in the Battle of Safin by the army of Muawiyah. By this time, the condition of the Islamic Ummah had reached an unbearable state. Corruption was rife amongst those with power, and the Bani Umayyah had wreaked havoc across the Muslim lands. When Yazid came to power, one of his first objectives was to gain the allegiance of Hussein, son of Ali, as his support would provide legitimacy to Yazid's otherwise illegitimate rule. Hussein, who had inherited the qualities of his father and grandfather before him, refused the request, and in doing so, put himself at risk of persecution from the Caliph. Yazid uh, was the son of Muawiyah. Muawiyah was the son of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was the, the greatest enemy of the Holy Prophet Yazid was known to everybody as an arrogant uh, young person that takes pleasure in anything that he likes. So Yazid was brought up as a, 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 any young man and uh, he didn't care much about Islam because his father couldn't care much about Islam. A person who in no way attempted to protect the teachings of our Prophet, nor in any way did he seek to be a reflection of the Holy Book. In one occasion, he bombarded the Kaaba and burned it which, according to all Muslims, Kaaba is the most holiest, the holiest place and the most sacred place in Islam. And this is Khalifa al-Muslimin, Yazid, who attacks and burns the Kaaba. In second incident, it was the attack on Medina, and it was called Waqat al-Harra, where the soldiers of Yazid were ordered to kill thousands of people and rape the girls and the ladies there. If you, you could find someone who would do an evil thing, then Yazid would do more and more. He broke every single law of Islam openly. News spread across the Ummah of Hussein's stance against Yazid. The people of Kufa, which was one of the weaker links in the Caliph's empire, called upon Hussein to lead them against Yazid in a bid to overthrow the Umayyad dynasty. Countless invitations were made to Hussein, who was by now on his way to Mecca to perform the Hajj pilgrimage. He decided to further investigate the situation in Kufa and to confirm their loyalty to him and his cause. So he sent Muslim son of Aqil. Muslim ibn Aqil was the deputy of Imam Hussain He was also the cousin of Imam Hussain and he was sent on command of Imam Hussain to Kufa when Kufians had called for help. So Imam Hussain had told Muslim Ibn Aqil to go to Kufa and do research on what are the issues and what is the situation in Kufa. The first finding of Muslim Aqil was that yes, these are all loyal to Hussain, I want him to come. So he sent his report to Imam Hussain that everything is ready and you're welcome. So Imam Hussein moved to Kufa. Muslim Aqil used to lead the prayers in the great mosque of Kufa. When he led the Salat al-Maghrib, 30,000 people were following him. The support for Muslim bin Aqil in Kufa had become a major threat to Yazid and his governor, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. During the evening prayers, people were sent from the court of the governor, publicly announcing that anyone found supporting Muslim bin Aqil will be tortured and put to death. Whatever was the case, it ended up with the finished Salat al-Maghrib, the 30,000 were reduced to 18 only. And when he finished his Salat al-Isha, there was none 
to John. Finding himself outnumbered and alone, Muslim saw the reality of the situation and quickly sent word to Hussein to cease his journey to Kufa. Muslim was surrounded by the army of Ubaidullah and was taken to the court of the governor, where he was tortured and finally beheaded. He had been dead a few days, and Kufa was under the control of Yazid before Muslim's message had reached the caravan of Hussein. By this time, Hussein, who was close to approaching Kufa, had been intercepted by an army sent by Yazid under the leadership of Hur ibn Yazid al riyahi On the 3rd of Muharram, in the year 61, Hussein and his caravan of family members were confronted and made to stop at Karbala by the river Euphrates. For it was not only Hussein's companions that chose to accompany him, but also his sons, his women, and younger children, in the knowledge that they were under grave danger and probable death. Were Hussein just to take his companions, certain people may argue that he was willing, yes, to sacrifice himself, but not sacrifice his family. Yet we find that Hussein takes alongside him his sons, takes alongside him his sister, takes alongside him his nephews, takes alongside him his brothers to show the world that the religion of Islam comes first and that the concept of justice comes first and that if it means that the family must lose their lives in order that the principle of justice continues and that the teachings of the Prophet are protected, then so be it. If someone went there with an intention of um, getting material wealth or worldly gain, obviously they would never take their women and their children. It just doesn't make sense. If it had only been the men there and they had been killed, there would have been no witnesses. Had Imam Hussein and just men from, that, um, from the family gone, then there would be no one to, to recount the stories of Karbala in, in its true form. It would be these children uh, whose blood was shed on the day of Ashura that would speak uh, about the unspeakable events of the day of Ashura. It would be the women, it would be Lady Zainab who would go out there and tell the world what occurred on the day of Ashura. Hussein offered to leave the Islamic lands and head east. Hur reported the offer back to the Caliph, yet Yazid was not open to such negotiations and insisted that Hussein and his small camp were annihilated. On hearing this news, Hur had to choose between success in this world or in the hereafter. There are many companions on the 10th of Muharram who one may look to as a source of inspiration in our lives. But one particular source of inspiration for myself is the companion Hur bin Yazid al riyahi Hur is a very good example to any human being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a chance to all of us to revert. On the, night, on the ninth night when he realized that the camp of Imam Hussein is thirsty, they're hungry, yet they're not still paying allegiance to Yazid, he realized that this was happening for a reason. He just searched within his soul and heart and he found the reason um, was in fact that they were on the right path. He listened to his instinct, he listened to his soul, he listened to the to the good part of his soul, and which said to her that you have realized your mistake, so walk forward. He looks one way and looks the other. And of course, he asks himself, now I am choosing between heaven and hell. And he recognizes that the place of success is with Imam al Hussein. When Hur was reaching the tent, Imam Hussein told Hazrat Abbas, the commander of his army, that go and receive your brother in faith is coming to you. When he reached there, the first question he asked him, I want to see that, or Hussein, if I repent, is my repentance going to be accepted? He pleads at the feet of Imam Hussein, asking for forgiveness from the Imam and asking for forgiveness from Sayyidah Zainab, the sister of the Imam, asking for forgiveness for the fact that he felt that he was the one responsible for the events at Karbala, for he had diverted them towards Karbala. Imam al Hussein says to him, Hur, you are a free man in this world and the hereafter. With Hur, it's really important because his story is so beautiful. It just proves the point that everyone is born with the light in their heart. 
and that light has been placed by Allah. Hulu's most important feature that we can take into our lives as Muslims is the fact that a person, the door of repentance is open for him at every stage in his life. On the night before the 10th of Muharram, across the plains of Karbala, preparations had begun for the following morning. It was now inevitable that there would be a battle. The camp of Hussein, quiet in prayers, came to realize that this would be their last night together. The night before was a big night. Uh, Lady Zainab is quoted as going up to her brother and saying to him, uh, do you have complete trust in your companions? Can you basically rely on them to protect you and to protect us tomorrow because it, tomorrow is a big day? Do you have that level of trust in your companions? The traditions tell us that one of the companions who was uh, basically guarding the tent in which Imam Hussein and his sister Zainab uh, were speaking to one another, he overheard the conversation between the brother and the sister. And he goes back to the tent of the companions and he tells them, listen, tonight's the night and right now what we need to do is to show our loyalty to our master. Right now what we need to do is, is to go and uh, give Lady Zainab the assurance that we are going to be the men that we claim to be. The Imam came to the companions and told them that my allegiance is off of you. There's no bayah. You've didn't, done your job. These people want to kill me. They have nothing to do. If you guys, you can use the night. They're not going to find you. You can leave right now. Go settle somewhere where they can't get a hold of you. They come out of their tents like roaring lions with chivalry, with courage, with such a, a great amount of, of conviction and strong and solid faith in their hearts that can only be possessed by a person who has witnessed his position in paradise. They all were fully aware that the Imam was doing something that was ordered for him to do by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Hussein alayhi salam said, I have never seen and I don't know the companions of anyone who are better than you, my companions. You could just imagine 73 of the most noble men history has ever witnessed. Amongst the companions was one who was recognized as being a person who hardly smiled in his life. They came to him on the 10th of Muharram. They asked him, how comes now you smile? Whereas the rest of your life you were hardly ever seen smiling. He says, my life has been a struggle, but now the struggle is complete with Hussein ibn Ali. Anyone who dies without knowing his imam of his time will die like a jahil. His death will be like a death of anyone who has passed in jahiliya, in ignorance age. So they knew that and they knew their imam. How could they again go against their imam? Allah wa rasul wa amri minkum. Obey Allah, obey the Messenger, and Ulul Amri Minkum. Those people who have been given authority among you, they knew that Imam Hussein salam, was their Imam. The beauty of the Imam was that Imam al Hussein sought to give the freedom of choice to his companions to allow them to continue living their life without the oppression that was going to be faced on the 10th of Muharram. On the 10th day, the day of Ashura, the companions did not allow any of the family of Hussein to commence battle before them. They fought bravely, one by one, until they all attained martyrdom. The 70,000 strong army of Yazid now faced only a handful of Hussein's family members. One of the youngest was the nephew of Hussein. Al-Qasim ibn Hassan, the son of Imam Hussein's own brother, Imam Hassan, his own nephew. Traditions state that he was 11 years old. Some say he was 14 years old. When Qasim ibn Hassan came to the Imam and asked him for going to the battlefield and actually fighting, if you could imagine the picture, because Qasim ibn Hassan is in his early teens, and you could imagine what an early teenager uh, looks like and can barely carry a sword with him 
and with the heavy armor that they had to wear in order to do something. So he comes and asks the Imam to go to the battlefield. And the minute he cast his eyes on his uncle, he begins to cry. Imam Hussein begins to cry and they embrace one another. They embrace and hold one another for so long until the traditions tell us that they both fell unconscious. It's a very, I think, a very tough moment for the Imam to allow even this person, this child, to go and fight. So it goes on. The, uh, he gets his permission and he goes and starts his fighting and he does get a few people down until the enemy gets him down and of course he calls for his uncle to come on him it's amazing that a child at that age could have courage like that that can actually go out there with 40, 50 year old men, younger, older than that, and say, I am Qasim ibn al Hassan, which they betrayed. Ali Akbar, of course, is the oldest son of the Imam. His morals were a reflection of his grandfather. His intellect was a reflection of his grandfather. Ali Akbar used to always insist, even as a young man, he used to say, allow the poor to come and eat from my hands. Yet what type of generosity did he face on the 10th of Muharram? After uh, the companions had all gone and fought their battles and became Shaheed, Ali Akbar was the first to go and ask permission to go and fight. So no one would think that the Imam uh, or the children of Imam think themselves as higher than the rest. He comes to his father to seek permission for him to leave. You see, with all the other family members of Imam Hussein, his nephews, his brothers, his, uh, uh, his cousins, with all of them, the case was that Imam Hussein would not grant them permission at the first, uh, at the first instance. They would come back, they would plead with him, they would beg him, and only then would the Imam give them permission. The only exception was that when Imam Hussein saw his own son Ali ibn al-Akbar come into the tent and he asked him for permission, the traditions say that Imam Hussein gave him the permission instantly. He didn't wait for him to, bleed, to plead. He didn't wait for him to, to besiege the Imam for permission. He gave him the permission straight away. It's his own son and the Imam is there in order to offer a sacrifice. He hugs Ali Akbar and then asks Ali Akbar to go and speak with the woman of the camp, with his mother and with his auntie, for it is the final hug he would give a mother and the final hug he gives an auntie. So he went and fought a great battle and killed a lot of the enemy and he returned to his father. And he tells his father again, he says, the heat of Karbala is killing me. What words does his father have to offer as consolation apart from saying to his son that my son, within a few moments, your grandfather will give you water from the pool of Kotha. He said his farewells to his father again and went and fought. And it's been said in history that he was hit one of the most, okay. There were, not, there were a lot of people fought in that battle, but some of them were hit the worst and mutilated. The history says that, they say about him, he says, irban irba. They, uh, more than mutilating, they really cut him to pieces. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala Eventually, Imam collects his son's body it's narrated in a hadith, Imam Hussein looks towards Najaf and he says towards Najaf, towards where his father is buried, Oh father, you are the one who lifted the gate of Khaybar, yet you never had to lift a spear from the chest of your son. Come towards Karbala and see me lifting the spear from the chest of my son Ali Akbar. Abbas was the flag bearer of Imam Hussein He was like the backbone of the soldiers who went to defend Imam Hussein He was known as a warrior. 
when the battle started, he would want to go and fight. I mean, uh, Abi Abdullah salatu wasalam, would not allow him and said that you are the backbone of this army. You need to stay alive. When the companions all went and fought, he wanted to go again. He wasn't granted permission. When the Ahl al-Bayt wanted to go, Bani Hashim, he came again and he was still not granted permission. And after a number of people had gone and uh, the majority of Bani Hashim was even gone, maybe a few of the smaller ones were left, Abbas came again and asked for permission. He was not granted. The Imam kept saying, no, how could I, le how could I let you go when you are the, s the bearer of my standard? How could I let you go when you, when you are the chief of my forces? How could I let you go when you are the one holding my flag? You are... You represent the, the hopes of all the family members. You represent the hopes and aspirations of all my daughters and the women and the children. How could I ever let you go? How could my tongue ever give you permission to leave? On the day of Ashura, they had not had any water. On that hot day, it was a summer day. In Karbala, very hot. And it's very dry too. Abu Fadl al-Abbas hears the pangs of thirst of the children around him. Amongst those children is his niece, Sukaina, who pleads for water. These children have not had water. So they're, all, they're, they're starting to have their cries. They've been having them since maybe early noon. And this is uh, continued until late afternoon. So they come to Abbas and ask, Uncle, we want water. And they're crying to him. So, when he came to the Imam and asked again for, to go to the battle, the Imam saw these children crying. He said, you can go and get them some water. Now the Imam, remember, gave him a specific mission. He didn't ask him to go and fight the enemy forces. He didn't ask him to go and defend Imam Hussein's life. He said, if you have to go, go, go and get some water. Abbas comes forward. He tells Sukaina, I will go now and I will bring you the water. He goes towards the Euphrates. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas wasn't out there to fight. He was out there with a mission and the mission was to bring back some water. He goes to the battlefield. He pushes away uh, a, a huge cavalry of the enemy forces from the water, from the river Euphrates. They realized that they can't get him. So what they decided was that they were going to wait for him to come back. In the meantime, go and hide between the trees, behind the trees. So when he comes, they can take him by surprise instead of coming in front and start fighting him. When he approaches the water, he enters the cool waters of the Euphrates. No one would have blamed Al-Abbas centuries later when we recall and recount his, uh, his, his story. No one would have blamed him. No one would have said, why didn't uh, why did Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas drink the, from, from the water? No one would have said Abu al-Fadl Abu al al-Abbas should have waited until his, his brother had a drink before he did. No one would have said that. When Hazrat Abbas took water with his hands, he wanted to taste the water. Then he remembered Sakina. He remembered the children who were with him, Abu Hussain He threw the water. He recognizes there are children who are thirsty. He recognizes there is a leader who is thirsty. He recognizes there is a sister who is thirsty. The most magnificent act of sacrifice and selflessness was displayed at that moment on the day of Ashura. History has never witnessed a moment of selflessness as that displayed and expressed by Al-Abbas on that day. When he was coming back, carrying the water, the enemies were here, ready to attack him. He chose the shorter distance, which was through the trees, the date yeah. trees. But then came the enemy and they cut his right hand. So he puts the container into his left arm. Another person from the left comes and takes that arm out too. But he is fighting his way to get to the camps and do what Imam Hussein asked him to do, which is to get the water to the children. So he puts it in his mouth, which is the last option that he has to hold. And he's continuing his way towards the camp. And one of the enemy realizes his plans and he shoots an arrow into the container 
the water starts spilling. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas has lost hope of going towards the uh, camps. Some history books say that he changed his path. Along the way, he is showered with arrows. All was in his mind is his imam, as well as the children who are waiting for the water. He can hear Sukaina's words. He can hear Sukaina's cries. He can hear the cries of the other children. He was not going to face the children because he, he had promised them water, he was not going to go back without water. And at the same time, someone from the back hit him on the back of his head. Abbas fell first onto his face to the ground before he let the standard fall. Because as we said, the standard represented all the hopes and aspirations that the women and the children and Imam Hussein held on that day. He fell to the ground and he started calling for his brother. He said, Ya Akha, Adrik Akhak. <laughs> and when Imam Hussein alayhi salam saw him on the ground, he came fighting against the enemy when he reached him. All that Abbas could say is that tell Sakina that I couldn't bring the water. When he passed away, you could see that Imam Hussein alayhi salam felt the pain and that at that time he said, really, my backbone has been broken when he saw that Abbas, Hazrat Abbas has been killed. The greatest sacrifice in Karbala, one may argue, is the sacrifice of a six-month-old. Imam comes forward in the heat of Karbala. Abbas and Ali Akbar and Qasim and Muslim and Habib and Hur may all have been able to control their thirst to a certain extent. Yet how does one expect a six-month-old to go without water or to go without milk? Yet we find Imam comes forward and shows the people that, look, you may want to come and kill me, but surely... You are not arrogant enough to kill a six-month-old. I may want to protect the message of my prophet, but the six-month-old is coming forward just looking for a drink of water. Imam wanted to symbolize to the whole world that these weren't people who were seeking to protect Islam. For the, seek, for the people who seek to protect Islam are not those who would ever massacre a six-month-old. Imam Islam took Ali Lazar and Abdullah to the battlefield and said, look, if you think that we, the grown-up, have some sort of thing to be punished for. Can you tell me about this innocent infant who did not commit any sin? There's no fault at all. He didn't do anything. Saying that says, if you think I will drink of the water, I will put Ali Asghar on, on the sands, these hot sands of Karbala, and then you give him the water. And as Imam Hussain places him on the floor, you see Ali Asghar's dry tongue come out. And this pulls the hearts of some of the people in your position. In an act of pure evil, Omar ibn Sa'ad, the general of Yazid's army at Karbala, gave orders to his main archer, Harmala, to strike the six-month-old son of Hussein, Ali Azdar. The irony being, the arrow used to pierce the neck of the infant was one that was more commonly used to kill wild beasts. Hussein, by now, a broken man, with the deaths of his close family members, struggled to break the news to his wife, Rabab, the mother of Ali Azhar. He walked back and forth from the tent of Rabab, calling out, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Surely we are from God, and to him we shall return. He does this on seven occasions. The people ask, why do you do this? He replies by stating, I do not know how to tell a mother that her six-month-old has a neck which is completely pierced. Imam had allowed men who were able to control their thirst to go before Ali Azhar. Yet he wanted to show the world that even a six-month-old is a symbol for justice. A six-month-old is a symbol of sacrifice. This was the martyrdom of 
to the last soldier in the camp of Sinaisi. Hussein was now alone. His companions had been killed. Abbas, his backbone, had been killed. His nephew Qasim had been killed. His son Ali Akbar had been killed. And now his youngest son Ali Azghar had been killed. The following is a brief account of the last tragic moments of Hussein's life. Imam Hussein advanced towards the enemy, raising his sword, losing all hope, all hope of survival. Abdullah ibn Ammar said, Never have I seen someone surrounded by a huge number of enemies and whose son is slaughtered, and so are his family as com and companions, and who still maintained his composure, remained relentless, and stayed courageous more than Hussein. He said, I am the one who is fighting you and women are not held accountable. So keep your robes away from them and stop them from harming my women as long as I am alive. Then he bade his family farewell for the second time, ordering them to be patient. He put on the outer mantles as he said, get ready for affliction, get ready for tribulation and be advised that Allah Almighty shall protect and safeguard you. The ladies who were raised in the lap of prophethood saw them the pillar of their security, the bulwark of their protection, the defender of their prestige, and the symbol of their honor, telling them of a departure from which he would never return. As for the wise lady of Beni Hashim, namely Zainab al Kubra, she saw all of that. We, we see how the secure niche of the religion was about to be dislocated, the rope of prophethood to be cut off, the lantern of the Sharia to be put out. As Imam Hussein was about to leave for the battlefield, he heard a cry from behind calling out, Ah, Mahla, Yabna Zahra. Wait for a moment, O son of Fatima. This is your sister Zainab. Imam Hussein stopped. His sister Zainab approached him. She said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, our mother Fatima asked if our mother Fatima instructed me to do something on this day and on the, in this moment. She wanted me to kiss you on the forehead and on your and on your throat. Imam Al Hussein came down. She kissed him on the forehead. She kissed him on the throat forehead would be the target of the stone on that day and the forehead would and the throat would be severed with a dagger. Imam Hussein attacked the enemy like an angry lion. Anyone who could catch up with him he stabbed with his sword and killed as he was receiving the arrows from all directions bracing them with his chest and with his neck. Having become too feeble to fight he stood to rest. It was then that a man threw a stone at him hitting his forehead and causing his blood to run down his face. He took his shirt to wipe his blood from his eyes, just as another man shot him with a three-pronged arrow, which pierced his chest and settled in his heart. He instantly said in the name of Allah, Bismillah, wa billah, wa fi sabilillah, wa ala millati rasulillah. And on the creed of the messenger of Allah, raising his head to the heavens, he said, O oh Lord, you know that they are killing a man besides whom there is no other son of your prophet's daughter. As soon as he took the arrow out of his back, blood gushed forth. Rubbed it on his face and beard as he said, Thus shall I appear when I meet my Lord and my grandfather, the messenger of Allah, drenched in my blood. It is then that I shall say, O oh, grandfather, so and so killed me. The enemies of Allah waited for a short while, then returned to Imam Hussein. When they surrounded, as they surrounded him as he sat on the ground, unable to stand. Then Umar ibn Sa'd 
Umar ibn Za'ad looked at the Imam and then he said to his soldiers, Arihu, Arihu, kill him, relieve him of, the, of this pain. Ah, uh, no one could do it. They just struck him one after the other. They kept blowing this, the, the strikes of the sword, the strikes of the sword at him one after the other. No one could dare kill the Imam. They all relied on one another. Imam Hussein was now waiting only for his death. Imam Hussein was going to die from the bleeding anyway. And yet Shimur came close to him. And it says, I could see and I could hear the children screaming, don't do that. Don't sever our father's head. I could hear Zainab shouting, don't kill my brother. I could see Zainab crying and saying, leave my brother alone. And I ran. He ran towards the killing pit while I, while I ran towards the killer himself. He drew and I drew. He drew the dagger from his pocket while I drew a sigh of grief from my chest. He severed and I severed. He severed and I severed. He severed my brother's, he severed my brother's head while I severed my hope. I bet you Allah After Hussein had been slaughtered on the desert plains of Karbala, the women and children of his camp were left defenseless. The decapitated bodies of Hussein's men were left to decay on the hot sands. The barbaric army of Yazid looted the tents of the family of the Prophet, setting each one on fire as they passed. The survivors from Hussein's camp were captured and taken to Damascus, not given a chance to bury their beloved dead. The responsibility of ensuring the safety of the captives and that the message of Hussein was kept alive was taken up by Zainab, the daughter of Ali and Fatima, and the sister of the martyred Hussein. The relevance of Imam al Hussein's sacrifice and the sacrifice of his family and his companions highlights number one, Islam's constant spread of the concept of justice. Number two, it highlights the importance of sacrifice towards the message of Islam. Number three, it highlights the propagation of the message of Islam. Number four, it highlights for us that continuously in our life, we must persevere in order to ensure that the human being is able to achieve freedom of thought and freedom of expression in society. Imam Hussein alayhi salam showed us that even if it will be for you to be killed, for you to be sacrificed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for you to protect the religion of Islam, do it so. And he did it with his action, not with his words. When we talk about justice and we talk about humanity, the name of Hussein comes synonym to that. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, yes, he was martyred in Karbala. He was, uh, his uh, family members, his companions were killed. But these people were killed physically. Spiritually, they are alive. The call of Imam al Hussein, Hal min Nasr and Yansurana is there anyone out there to help us is there a helper to come towards us this call was a message for the opposition on the 10th of muharram but was also a call towards us today in each of our lives we must ask ourselves are we helping the message of imam al hussein are we spreading it towards muslims and non-muslims alike are we writing about this message karbala showed us that what we can learn from it is that we have to distinguish between right and wrong. The world seeks to follow such people as role models. Therefore, in the same way we see contemporary figures who have stood up for justice, Hussein ibn Ali comes as the highest in this list, as a man who on the battlefield was the bravest, but as a man who off the battlefield was the most generous, 
and the man who told us that if it means that his life had to be killed, his life had to be ended in order that the light of the candle of Islam continued, then it did not matter for the light of the candle of freedom and the light of the candle of expression and speech and justice is the light that we must always seek to ensure continues to shine. So it is for us to apply Karbala in our life and in order for us to live a happy life either here or in the next world inshallah. I think that Imam Hussain alayhi salam represents not only the Shia but Islam itself and the stand against oppression. It's such a great sacrifice, not for just not for even for people of of his religion, but people all for all humanity. We can learn patience from that, and we can learn perseverance, and hopefully we can all benefit from it. Well, the sacrifice Imam Hussein made to me as being a new Muslim, that's the main thing that got me into Islam. Imam Hussein to me, he means a lot. Actually, it's my whole life, he changes everything. I can relate to this every year and look back upon it and reflect. The pain and sufferings that he went through is nowhere near the simple tribulations that we go through today. His message is everything. And it can affect you emotionally, mentally and spiritually. It teaches me like to have no fear. Imam Hussein Islam is for all of mankind. Patience. Patience. Bravery, passion, motivation, determination. What did he die for? He died for us, he died for Shia, he died for Islam. <laughs> 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 <laughs>